Hans-Josef von Balthasar was a, a Swiss theologian um, uh, whose life really spanned the 20th century, and he's considered by many to be um, one of the very greatest uh, Catholic theologians of the 20th century. Um, he was a friend of, of, of many greats. Uh, he's associated with the um, Ressourcement movement in, in Catholic theology, which is a, a drawing on the resources of uh, the church to respond to the uh, questions posed by modernity and to, and to go all the way back, not just uh, scholasticism, but uh, into the patristics. Um, and in a certain sense, even even more broadly, uh, he was a great friend of Henri de Lubac, uh, a founder of a, a community with Adrien von Speyer, uh, 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 a mystic, uh, mystical doctor, um, and he uh, <clears throat> was also uh, for his entire life a great lover of beauty. At one point, he had to decide whether to become a, a concert pianist or uh, to pursue his studies, and he decided to pr pursue his studies, but he never gave up his, his deep, deep love of music. Um, uh, so as I said, he's one of the great uh, theologians of the 20th century, and some people would say of all time. And uh, I, I would include myself in, in, in that group. I, I, I find that, that Balthazar has a, a more than a, 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 a temporary significance. Uh, he's not just a 20th century thinker. What is distinctive about uh, Balthazar's thought is he uh, sought to draw on the entire tradition uh, and gather it all up. So uh, he's, he's great not for just simply introducing a few new ideas here and there, uh, nor does he on the other side simply rehash old ideas. Uh, he had a remarkable ability to, to take up the whole um, that preceded him and uh, to reconfigure it under a new sign. And uh, one way to articulate the way that he did that is to, is to identify that the specific sign under which he gathered up the whole tradition uh, is the sign of beauty. Uh, if I may read just a, a, a brief text here from uh, Cardinal Rot uh, Ratzinger, uh, Benedict XVI, but he was Cardinal Ratzinger when he wrote this. Um, uh, this is in the, uh, the appendix of, of the readers that you all have, uh, where he mentions Hansers von Balthasar, um, specifically in talking about the beauty of Christ. He says, being struck and overcome by the beauty of Christ, if you care to follow, it's on page 207. Uh, being struck and overcome by the beauty of Christ is a more real, more profound knowledge than mere rational deduction. Of course, we must not underrate, underrate the importance of theological reflection, of exact and precise theological thought. It remains absolutely necessary, but to move from here to disdain or to reject the impact produced by the response of the heart in the encounter with beauty as a true form of knowledge would impoverish us and dry up our faith and our theology. We, meet, we must rediscover this form of knowledge. It is a pressing need of our time. Uh, starting with this concept, Hans Urs von Balthasar bit, built his opus magnum of theological aesthetics. Many of its details have passed into theological work, while his fundamental approach, in truth the essential element of the whole work, has not been so readily accepted. And he continues on. Um, so uh, Ratzinger is pointing to Balthazar as, as, as uh, attempting to address this need to recover beauty. And he characterizes Balthazar's work as a theological aesthetics. In fact, the opus magnum that he uh, uh, mentions there um, more properly, uh, it's, it's, it's referred to as, as Balthazar's trilogy. He wrote it during the last uh, 25 to 30 years of his life. And uh, trilogy, you think three books. Uh, this is 15 books. Um, uh, he, he wrote, uh, uh, over the course of his life, a mountain of, of uh, books and a mountain range of articles. Um, uh, but uh, the, th the, the trilogy is 15 books that are organized according to um, the, the so-called transcendental properties, uh, truth, beauty, and goodness. But what's interesting about Balthazar's presentation is, is he presents the order differently from what one typically expects. Uh, you discussed Kant, I believe, yesterday. And in Kant, you have the famous three critiques, critique of pure reason, which is truth, you might say, the critique of practical reason, 
concerning morality and therefore the good, and then the critique of judgment, it comes last. Uh, uh, Balthazar makes reference to the fact that philosophers come, tend to come to beauty last. Um, uh, but he says we here must begin with beauty, uh, becomes first. And I hope over the course of this uh, 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 brief presentation to, to give you some sense of that, because I'm, I'm going to return to, the, to the, that point at the, at the very, very end. Um, but his trilogy uh, consists of first seven volumes on Technically, this would be the theological aesthetics, the glory of the Lord. Um, his theological aesthetics is really the first part of his magnum opus. Some people refer to the whole as a theological aesthetics, and they do that because that's the most distinctive, that's what gives you the key to the rest. But it's really just the first part that's the theological aesthetics. The second part is a theodrama, the drama of man inside the drama of God, the action of redemption, and then the theologic, uh, the true is um, uh, uh, properly uh, uh, interpretation of the meaning of God, the logos of God. So you go from beauty to goodness to truth, and then there's a little uh, epilogue at the end. Now, <clears throat> the basic purpose of Balthazar's uh, uh, magnum opus here is um, uh, the basic purpose really of all theology in its proper sense, and that is uh, it's meant to communicate the faith, to, to communicate the faith. That's very easy to say and simple to say, but the, um, that, that's really a profound thing. To communicate the faith doesn't mean simply give arguments for it, to explain it, um, to, to uh, 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 convince, and so forth. Um, uh, it includes all of those things, but um, it's, it's much more. It's, it's, it's uh, 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 passing on uh, the faith. Now, um, it's important to recognize that the faith is not a mere subjective disposition, uh, an inclination, a, a willingness to be believe. When we talk about faith, um, uh, uh, particularly uh, from the classical tradition, f faith has uh, an objective di dimension. It's both the subjective disposition, but also the objective content. Um, and communicating the faith means attending to both in a way, uh, 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 provoking a certain subjective disposition, simultaneous with uh, presenting uh, a particular content. Um, and, and, and we'll see why, why beauty uh, is so, so essential to that. Um, but even simply stating it in those terms, we have to recognize that there's a, f a fundamental problem that faces us right, right away, right at the outset. Um, with the, this notion of, of the intelligible content, the objective content, the, the, the meaning of faith. And what is that? Um, uh, faith is the appropriation of the mysteries of God. And God is obviously infinite and infinitely transcendent of our capacity to understand our capa capacity even to, to perceive in a way. God is, is beyond all human capacity. So here's the problem. How do we communicate this mystery in a way that, that makes it accessible, but at the same time does not reduce its mystery? Uh, and there, there, there are two uh, uh, pro possible false uh, 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 ways of doing that, two, two um, uh, missteps, you might say, um, that are, I think, uh, very obvious once the moment we reflect on it. The one it would be to reduce the infinite mystery of God to, to human size, as it were, simply to uh, re reduce this great mystery to our human capacity to understand. So to reduce the mystery of God to our concepts, to reduce the mystery of God uh, even to our sentiments. Um, the, uh, 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 the essay um, in the appendix of the, of the book uh, on Kitsch is, is, uh, is very interesting in that regard, the re reduction of, of, of beauty to, uh, to human sentiment. Um, it seems to me that, that uh, there's, there's something analogous in, in uh, theological expositions. We can reduce God to our sen sentiment. So that's, that's one, that we, we cut down the mystery of God. The other... Um, uh, misstep, the other false approach would be to overemphasize 
the mystery of God. It might seem to be um, uh, a very pious thing to, uh, in the end, fall down in silence and speak of the infinite darkness of the mystery of God. That, In some sense, that seems like a very pious act. But notice, if, if we absolutize that, um, uh, in a certain sense, we're, 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 we're going to end up taking the, the, the fangs out of Christianity. When, when, when something becomes an infinite mystery, it can no longer really speak to us. It can no longer make any sort of claim on us. It's very interesting if you, if you see in some, in some thinkers who are radically apophatic in this sense that tend to overemphasize the mystery of God, um, they tend to, to um, obscure, for example, questions of morality. That, that, in a sense, morality doesn't, doesn't really matter because we're talking about the infinite mystery of God. And, but notice, we're, we're, we're trying to preserve God's greatness, and, and in a certain sense, we do that by reducing him to something that's not making any cl claim on us. So this, this over uh, m m mysterifying, uh, mystiquing of God um, is also a, f a false move. It's, it's, it's almost saying that God has not revealed himself to us. There's no difference in this case between God having revealed himself to us and not having revealed himself to us on that false route. So somehow, on the one hand, we reduce God to the finite. On the other hand, we have God as pure infinity. Um, and both of these are problematic. Now, uh, Balthazar believes that the way out of this problem is beauty, that beauty is really crucial. Um, why? To put it in a very, very simple nutshell, um, what, what beauty does um, is uh, it does not, you might say, simply bring the infinite down to our terms, as it were, to, to our level. But beauty, in fact, raises us up, lifts us up into the mystery. And in ways uh, that, that, that uh, uh, summary that, that Professor uh, Crosby put at the end of his talk of the, the, the uh, implications of some of uh, von Hildebrand's insights uh, fit this point very beautifully, as we'll see, um, uh, that, that beauty has this extraordinary capacity to reach down into our very flesh and yet reach down into that flesh with a spiritual light. Uh, and so uh, it, it has this marvelous capacity to bridge the gap. This is something that Plato saw. Um, uh, 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 Plato is not a Platonist. Uh, the Platonists tend to divide the, 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 the spiritual and the sensible. But Plato in the Phaedrus, he says that beauty is the one spiritual form that we can actually see with our physical eyes. <laughs> Uh, that it somehow is so radiant that it can actually reach our senses. And that then provides the, the, the pivot for the whole uh, for him. Now, <clears throat> um, uh, I'm going to explain that point uh, a bit further as we look in the specifics of, of Balthazar's aesthetics here. Um, uh, but I'll begin by making the observation that he does, uh, and that is this point that we've, um, that I believe you've been discussing here over the last few days, uh, the fact that beauty has been neglected in the tradition. Um, uh, it's not as if the, the, the tradition has been ignorant of beauty. It's always been present. And one of the things that you discover if you read Balthazar's uh, Glory of the Lord, the first volumes, is, is he pulls out these, these, th these strands that have been present in the tradition that are just extraordinary. It's always been present, but it tends to have been present in the background. Uh, we take things like truth and, and goodness to be serious matters worth dying for. You die for truth. You die for uh, a moral principle. But you don't often uh, have martyrs to beauty, uh, one that would die, die, die for beauty. It doesn't seem, in a certain sense, to have the same sort of seriousness. But for Balthazar, as, as, as he explains in, in, the, in the reading uh, that you all have, um, uh, the reason it's in the background is not because it's less important, it's precisely because it's so important. It forms the very context in which truth and goodness make sense. Uh, it's, he, he makes this very strong claim. It's by virtue of beauty that truth is really true and goodness is really good. And if we neglect 
and it's it's it, that's why it's in the background of them. It supports them, you might say. And if it if it were to be uh, uh, left behind, we would find that truth no longer makes sense, and that the good no longer really attracts us. Uh, these are signs of of a loss of beauty. Um, uh, uh, so it's something that we need to to uh, recover. Now. <clears throat> Um, it's not enough uh, simply to recover beauty as uh, the ultimate integration, perhaps, of truth and goodness. As I indicated earlier, uh, it's crucial for, for Balthazar to see that it's primary, that beauty has to come in a certain sense first. Now, wh why should that be? Um, uh, in a nutshell, it is because for Balthazar, beauty, in a way, contains the whole in Nuce. All of the, it, 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 it is a, an extraordinary phenomenon that's, that seems to have this capacity to hold together all of the kinds of things that we tend to split apart. So for example, um, it, it's a, a mysterious conjunction. And when I say hold together, it doesn't mean that, that it blends them into each other. Uh, it, it brings these things together in a way that preserves the real difference, but it's unity and difference. So what, what are the sorts of things? Um, transcendence and imminence uh, uh, in, the, in just the manner we've been discussing. The body and the soul. The intellect and the senses. The mind and the heart. Um, also, uh, subject and object. Um, the, the, the beauty is, is a kind of an event that, that occurs between a subject and object. And so it's both objective and subjective in, in, cru in crucial ways. Um, and then ultimately, the supernatural, or grace, the theological, and, and the natural. Beauty, in this sense, lies at the very in intersection, in a way, of God and the world. Now, uh, for all these reasons, uh, uh, for Balthazar, um, uh, it, it turns out that, that Christianity, that beauty has a particular place in Christianity. It's very interesting if you look at art history. Uh, um, uh, up until the Renaissance, um, art history and the history of the church were more or less the same thing. They were... They were uh, 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 flip sides of the very same coin, um, so that that was for 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 thousands of years, and this is true, especially of of the Christian tradition. Um, it's very interesting uh, uh, to consider and explore what beauty has been in 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 other uh, in other traditions. Um, I think I think you'll find some some really uh, remarkable uh, things if you if you chase down that question. Um, why would it be so particularly Christian? Well, because of the incarnation, because um, the, in, the, the, the God has uh, entered into human flesh, and that that's at the that's the hinge of the Christian faith, and I, I'm, I'm suggesting here in a certain sense, that's the very gesture, that's the, the essence of what beauty is. Uh, uh, it's a kind of a, a natural analog to the, to the incarnation. Okay, now let's take a look at some uh, of the things that Balthazar uh, says specifically. First of all, um, what exactly is beauty for Balthazar? <clears throat> <clears throat> I won't um, um, read from the pages, but I'll, I'll, uh, if you want to take a look on page uh, 19 and 20 from Balthazar's text, and then again um, on page 118 towards the top. He articulates what is essentially, effectively, a definition of beauty, and that is the, the unity of form and splendor. Um, <clears throat> the, the unity of of uh, form as gestalt, uh, shape, outward appearance, and uh, splendor, a kind of a light that radiates uh, from the form. It seems to me that that's not something we need to, I need to uh, talk about so much because uh, that uh, Professor Crosby said quite a bit about that. Um, uh, and Balthazar is very much on the same line that in, 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 in a, uh, 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 
an experience of beauty, what you see is, is somehow uh, a wholeness come together. And, and in, the, in the coming together of a wholeness, um, suddenly a kind of a light breaks forth. There's a, we, we speak of the form having a certain radiance or splendor. Of course, that's, that's metaphorical language. It doesn't literally light up. You couldn't use a, you know, a, a painting to find your way in the dark. But it's, it's a, 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 a metaphorical illumination that I think we all know what I'm talking about. We've all had that experience. Now, um, when Balthazar proposes this as, as his, his uh, definition, he doesn't mean in any sense to be novel here. This is a very, very traditional perspective. Um, uh, this is essentially what Aquinas uh, understands by beauty. It's, um, we can trace it through the tradition. Um, so he's not, he's not intending to be um, revolutionary in any, in any sense. Uh, but what is striking about his uh, aesthetics is what he, the implications that he draws from this very simple sense of what beauty is. And uh, it seems to me that the heart of the matter the, the, uh, for Balthazar, this is the central point around which absolutely everything turns. <laughs> and that is the inseparability of the form and light, the inseparability of the two. That when we see, we, can, we can't separate them. It's not as if we first see an aesthetic form and then that triggers this light. It then lights up for us. Or first somehow we have a light and that leads us to see a form, but they are simultaneous. We catch sight of the form precisely in the illumination uh, of, of its, its radiance. Um, it's only when we, when we see, when the, when the light strikes us, that we are able to gather up the disparate dimensions of a thing. You might think of, of reading a poem over and over again, and it makes no impression on you, but then suddenly you say, aha, you, you have that moment, I see it. What happens? You suddenly start to see how the threads of it are, are connected together. And that, there's an illumination. There's a, there's a radiance that occurs, and it occurs precisely when you put the parts together. And, and it's simultaneous with that. Okay, why is that so important? Um, we'll unfold the, the significance of this. Um, <clears throat> uh, but, but notice too, if, if it's the case that, um, uh, that the, 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 the form and the light go together and that, that uh, this happens in a very particular experience when we say, aha, notice how there's a, a, a conjunction of subject and object. Uh, a, a, a dozen people can be looking at the same form and it doesn't light up for them. Uh, then suddenly one person says, aha, in the group. Uh, uh, suddenly that person has a kind of, there's an epiphany there. Uh, there's, there's something about the person's particular disposition that makes that possible. Um, that's not because beauty is subjective. Uh, it's because it's objective, but it's an objective in a way that requires subjectivity. It has a simultane simultaneous objective and subjective component that can't be uh, separated from each other. Now, um, uh, this is a point that has come up um, uh, several times in different ways in the, in the questions after uh, Professor Crosby's uh, presentation. Um, and uh, uh, I think this would be, in a way, Balthazar's way of answering those particular questions. Um, and that is this. Uh, when, <clears throat> when Balthazar talks about this uh, unity of form and light, um, one of the ways he sometimes expresses that is to talk about uh, the appearing of depths. There's a mystery that, that becomes manifest. So that's a, a certain language that he uses. And that leads us, um, we who are philosophical inquirers, to ask the question, depths of what? What is that that's coming to expression here? Um, uh, and we saw, in a certain sense, 
um, Hildebrand indicates, he's talking about a very similar thing. Uh, he, hint, he, he articulates it, makes it precise, but he doesn't, he doesn't seek to explain it. Um, uh, Balthazar m makes some efforts in, 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 uh, in that regard, um, not in the text that I saw you, uh, that, I, that I gave to you to, to read, but, um, uh, uh, but elsewhere, and hints of it are in the, in the, um, are in the, the epilogue that were uh, included as a, a, an appendix. Um, but, but I think it's really important to try to articulate what that is. So what is it when, when Balthazar says the depths are appearing, what does he mean by de depths? It seems to me that he, this is the crucial point. He means inseparably three different things. Inseparably three different things. One, that the depths are the depths of the thing itself. When, we, when the beauty of a tree strikes us, it is in one respect, the, something like the metaphysical beauty. We're seeing this, the, the, the life principle of the tree, its own, its own inner being is somehow uh, uh, manifesting itself to us in our experience of it. So in one sense, it, on one hand, the, the mystery that we perceive in this epiphany is the, tr is the thing itself. Secondly, the second mystery is the mystery of being simply. The mystery of reality that coincides with that. Not only in the, in the vision of the beautiful tree, it's not only the beauty of the tree, but somehow we have something about the glory of creation. We have the sense that reality is somehow making itself known to us in, in this particular moment. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that this is, is such an overwhelming experience. Uh, and then third is the mystery of God himself. The creator, the first cause. Um, let, me, let me, again, re-emphasize that point. These are, for Balthazar, inseparable. That's, it, 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 it can't be overemphasized, uh, the importance of this. Why? Because it shows us that, um, uh, that in a certain sense, we, uh, it, it overcomes this dualism between God and the world, between the spirit and the flesh. Um, the, uh, the, the more attentive we are to the particularity of the beauty of this tree, the more attentive we are to the mystery of creation as a whole. There's, those aren't, it's not as if we turn our attention away from one and to the other. In a certain sense, they're simultaneous. And, and, and that simultaneity is also an opening up into the mystery of God. And all of these things happen at one and the same time. So when Balthazar says at the beginning of the um, uh, text in your appendix, he talks about uh, beauty as a self-showing. Beauty is a self-showing. Things show, show themselves. So what is the self? Who is that self? Is it the tree? Is it being? Is it God? And what's the answer? Yes. <laughs> yes. All of those all at the same time. Okay. Now, uh, it's precisely that all at once-ness that is... is is essential to the nature of beauty that allows Balthazar to uh, build his, his theology on it. Um, there's something about that, that that opens us up in a natural way to uh, a theological understanding, uh, 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 an insight into who God is. Um, and and this, this natural opening uh, becomes clearer when we look at... Um, uh, the way Balthazar describes the experience of beauty uh, on page 119 and, and, and 120. And here, I am going to read it. Uh, uh, he's talking about um, the preface to uh, the, the Christmas liturgy, this, this short little sentence, a, pre a preface to the Christian mystery, uh, Christian, uh, sorry, Christmas liturgy. And it's, it's not an accident. 
why the Christmas liturgy is the mystery of the incarnation. The incarnation is God's appearing in the flesh, in, in Christ. That's, that's the heart of what, uh, 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 of, of what is behind beauty, as I said. Um, uh, in this text, I won't read the Latin. I'll read the translation, the footnote here. He says, because through the mystery of the incarnate word, the new light of your brightness has shown unto the eyes of our mind. Not just into our mind, but onto the eyes of our mind. Spiritual senses. Uh, that knowing God visibly, we might be snatched up by this into the love of invisible things. And he says, uh, he makes two points here uh, after quoting the text. He says, one, notice, to the eyes of our mind, which are struck by a new light from God, which then enables them to know visibly Contempl contemplatively, an object which is actually God. But God as mediated by the sacramental form of the mystery of the enfleshed word. And then the second point, to a mediating, the second pair in the Latin, to a mediating vision which occasions a rapture and a transport to an eros love, amor, it says amor, it doesn't say caritas, it says amor, eros, as opposed to agape, not as opposed to, but uh, uh, as distinct from. For those things unseen which had announced themselves by appearing in the visibleness and revelation of the incarnation. So the two moments of the experience of beauty for Balthazar are vision and rapture. Uh, vision is, and these correspond to form and light, uh, uh, which is more um, evident when we think of light in terms of the appearance of, of the depths of this threefold mystery. Um, uh, the vision is when we perceive it, we see how the particular aesthetic form fits together, and in the depths, it's because what we are seeing in that form is a light that is more than just that form, that seeing has a component of lifting us beyond our immediate perception. We're taken up by it. There's a kind of ecstatic moment in the experience of beauty. And so we, 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 we have to ask this question. So wh which comes first? Do we first have the vision and the vision causes the rapture? Or is it precisely in being lifted up by the light that we're able to have the vision. Which is it? And the answer is? Yes. yes. It's both. They are interdependent, and this is crucial. It's only in being lifted up that we see, and it's only in seeing that we are lifted up. And those are, are simultaneous and cannot be separated without uh, uh, running into some serious problems. Um, <clears throat> Uh, this is why we, he says that beauty, he talks about beauty moving us. Now, um, it's, it's, it's a moving, uh, uh, the experience of beauty is a moving that has, in a certain sense, already happened. Uh, we don't simply see the beauty that then sets us in motion, but when we, we find, as we are catching sight, we find that we're already being lifted up. We're already uh, 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 in motion. Um, uh, this... The, 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 the appearance of the beautiful form and the depths that remain hidden and yet manifest, veiled and unveiled at the same time, um, all of that causes a kind of ecstasy, an ecstasis. Um, and, and that's why Balthazar in this text says it is not an accident that the Christmas preface uses the word amor. And when he explicates this text, he draws on a, a passage from Dionysius the Areopagite. Some people call him Pseudo Dionysius. I like to call him by the name that he asked to be called by, Dionysius the Areopagite, um, uh, from the divine names in which he talks about uh, this divine love precisely as uh, he uses the word eros. Um, uh, that passage that he quotes, um, I have always taken to be the, the very pinnacle of human thought. Book four, chapters 1 through 17 of the divine names, I think the, the human mind has never, has never gone further on this earth than in those passages. And it's right from the center of that that Balthaz, Balthazar cites this. Um, uh, the eros is, 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 is crucial. 
uh, just as the, the, the visibility of, of the beautiful form is, is crucial. Okay, so um, back to the beginning. <clears throat> we began with uh, a theology uh, or we began with uh, uh, um, noting that Balthazar built his theology on beauty. So why? Um, it seems to me it becomes a little more uh, evident here. Um, because of this simultaneity of vision and rapture, um, vision is, a, is, a, is an understanding, a, cl a clarity that we can get, but it's a clarity that comes to us not by being reduced to us, but be, it, it's something that we can receive only by being taken up higher, lifted higher than our, uh, you might say, merely human um, capacities. Um, if, if it were, if, from a theological perspective, if it were simply the case that our uh, relation to God were first a matter of vision and then rapture, we would be in too much control. Uh, it, the, the, the movement to God would be something that we do. Um, we've grasped it, we know, and now we move ourselves. This is the danger of beginning with truth uh, uh, as prior to the act of the will in, in a traditional Thomas perspective, for instance, um, rather than beginning with, with beauty. Um, if it, on the other hand, were simply that we were lifted up first, if the rapture came before the vision, uh, human freedom would be eliminated. We would be talking about a kind of a blind obedience, a leap of faith and th that's totally irrational, um, maybe at the end of which we hope to have some sort of an understanding. Um, it has to be the simultaneity of vision and rapture. Uh, and there we have a, f a full use of human freedom, but it's a full use of human freedom inside of being are being lifted up to God. And so um, this makes sense of the structure of Balthazar's trilogy. Beauty is, he says, the first word that we must say. It's the first word because it precisely sets the proper horizon as a stage on which the theodrama can play itself out. Our relationship to God, our uh, being called by God and responding, the interaction of divine and human freedom under the sign of the good now is the second moment. And according to Balthazar, um, the proper uh, engagement in the theodrama yields as its fruit wisdom, a deeper understanding. Uh, and here we have the moment of the true. But precisely because this fruit this truth, this understanding is, is a fruit of our free interaction with God. It's not a pure rationalistic concept. It is rational. It is intelligible. But it's, 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 it's the fruit of freedom. Um, but it's not merely the fruit of freedom because freedom itself is the fruit of the experience of beauty. If we began simply with human freedom, God would be under our control. Uh, we, are, we are moved to respond to God. We respond and then we understand. And it's because of that, he says, that beauty is not only the first word, but it is a word that we discover in the end that we never have to take back. It's also, in some sense, the final word.